Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey. This is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to be chatting about Pierre Polyev promising to end both industrial and consumer carbon taxes, prominent scientists arguing the goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions should be scrapped, Canada being on track for a record number of asylum claimants, healthcare costs for the typical Canadian family reaching nearly $18,000 annually, Trump considering offering RFK Jr. a position within his administration, and French authorities arresting the CEO of Telegram. This podcast is brought to you by Higher Health Organ Supplements, sourced from 100% grass-fed, grass-finished cattle raised by Canadian regenerative farmers. These supplements are designed to fill the nutrient gaps in our modern diets. Higher Health, connecting people to real food. All right, let's get into it. So first off, we've got Pierre Polyev promising to end both industrial and consumer carbon taxes if elected. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has pledged to eliminate the carbon tax for both large corporations and ordinary Canadians if elected. In a recent CBC interview, Polyev also promised to scrap the clean fuel regulations, which he claims will increase fuel costs by 17 cents per litre by 2030. He criticized the Liberals and Bloc for supporting higher gas prices and capital gains taxes, arguing that these policies burden businesses and individuals. Polyev's plan aims to reduce taxes and simplify the tax system to boost the economy. He highlighted that the carbon tax's economic impact is significant, estimating losses of $11.9 billion in 2024, with costs rising to $30 billion by 2030. So, should, should there be any level of taxation for environmental causes, or do you support Pierre's hard stance against them? I actually think that we could have some sort of system in place to manage sort of how these companies behave. So like a carbon credit system is a good way to look at it. And I'll tell you why I like that. So, and I'm not even sure that that's the right, that the right system, but it's a good way to explain what I'm going to say. So if you implement a carbon credit system, um, everybody can emit X amount. And then anything over that, it's going to cost you more money. That's kind of the way I see it in this carbon credit game. And if you need to buy credits, you can buy them from other companies, right? So, you know, Elon Musk made billions of dollars in credits when he obviously, when he had Tesla in California, because they have a carbon credit system. So um, what you do is you create sort of this benchmark in understanding the industries. And it has to be based on revenue and production, obviously, too. You can't blanket it. It's like, hey, if you do 10 million, you get X. If you do 100 million, you get Y. And that, that, that only makes sense. So once this thing's in place, if you don't use your credits, you can sell them. And then you can add that to your bottom line, which is great because it's just profit, right? Now, here's why I think this is a beneficial system. First, it will keep companies in check to a certain degree, right? And again, I don't really know the right economics to use right now. So keep that in mind. But here's why this is valuable. If you have two companies that are the same, they're neck and neck, right? They're both $100 million companies, and they're continuing to try to innovate and change and whatever. Um, if one of them is doing a lot better for, for the environment, they can sell their carbon credits, right? If they can sell their carbon credits to another company, then theoretically, they can drop their prices and still keep their profit margin. So you can drive prices down, whereas the other company that's not, well, they can't compete unless they actually, unless they actually find a way to lower their environmental impact. So you can sort of... It's a problem that will sort of solve itself because of competition within the market. If you introduce a carbon credit system, the industry as a whole will, will not all at once, but it'll kind of work its way down. And eventually you won't even need a carbon credit system because you'll have this benchmark and they'll all be below it. Otherwise, you can't stay competitive with your nearest competitors that are doing a better job environmentally. So I do think there's some value in that space. And I think there's a, probably a good way to implement it. I don't agree with how we're doing it now, but here, here's, and here, here's the other reason why. So. You look at sort of the carbon tax for individuals. They say, well, we're going to tax heating your home and, and gas for your car. There's no economic lever you and I can pull to, to, to make more money to cover that cost. We just go, well, if I don't drive, I don't have a job. If I don't heat my home, I'll die in Canada. There's nothing I have to, so, it's, so I can't reduce this. What, what can you actually reduce by 5, 10%? Maybe, but these carbon taxes are getting ridiculous. They're going to quadruple. So for individuals, it makes zero sense. But for businesses, there is an economic lever they can pull to sort of make up ground there. So even when it comes to, say, something like a carbon tax system, like a, a carbon credits or whatever, any of this sort of taxation, 
I just won't give it any more benefit of the doubt any after realizing how the liberal government has been ta- telling us the necessity of taxing us in order to save the environment since they got into office in 2015, yeah. right? Well, l- let's look at what we've seen since then with things like Parks Canada and the forest fires, the budget for dealing with those has nearly uh, decreased by half o- over the- over that period. And so they keep telling us that okay, well, we need more money to deal with the environment, but then the bureaucracies that were created in order to deal with the environment are going down in funding. It doesn't make sense. Where is this money going? And you see things like the the Green, green Slush Fund that was headed by that lady who has now uh, been charged. I don't know if she's probably not even being criminally charged. Probably but, not. It's probably going to maintain. It's probably going to be within the, the political system, so nothing will happen to her. But she was found to be giving some of that money, which was supposed to go towards sustainable development to her own companies. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then also that was a, that, that fund had a billion dollars. And I think somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred to 200 million of that was, is currently under investigation of like, where does this money go? Yeah. And so until all of that stuff gets sorted, I'm just not in favor of any of these taxes in general. So I think we're saying two sort of different things because I'm, I agree with you. We're on the same page. I think that having a system to manage and monitor our environmental impact is important. Otherwise people just dump shit in the water mm-hmm. and we still can't swim in Lake Ontario. So you can see the impact is not great. So if you think about it from a, from a, from a corporate perspective, the only thing they care about is going to be the bottom line, especially if they're publicly traded. It's a fiduciary duty. So when you think about that, Unless there's an economic consequence to it, how else do you curb it? So I think that that is important. Now, there can be laws put in place that can be very penal for stuff like that. But that being said, I use nuclear waste in the water. That, that's a bit insane. Most companies don't even produce that kind of stuff. That's why you could say, well, maybe it's not carbon, but whatever, whatever the metrics are, whatever, the, whatever those are, um, if you have something in place, companies will innovate and they will keep it down to maintain their competition in the market. But um, that being said... I don't currently think any government can properly manage these funds. Of course not. Like it's, it's to me, they're two different things. Yes, this would be a good system in my mind to maybe quell environmental impact, but giving any taxes to the government based on what they've done is just, you're just throwing it into a black hole. It's stupid. So it's, I I told, I think we're we're on the same page. Yeah. And like, again, I'm not saying there isn't systems that you could theoretically build in order to work towards those ideals or goals, but just that when we understand the government incentive structure, they're not the people to implement these kind of things. No, no, absolutely not. And so, in one thing, but so for the environment front, hey, if if there is literally like a company that is draining off excess waste into rivers and such, or even, you know, we just saw there was a oil tanker that was attacked uh, uh, in the Red Sea, which was just blown up. Now there's probably oil. That's probably a massive oil spill of sorts. Guaranteed. Um, or the the big BP oil uh, issue that happened a few years back. Go ahead, deal with those people. But like we already have things in place to criminally charge those people and put them or even financial penalties as well if they're found to be polluting like actual pollutants but when we get into this carbon taxing stuff like now you're starting to implement taxes and down to what kind of food people are consuming or this or that and trying to get away from red meat and taxing that stuff higher and um we saw over in it was denmark right where they introduced the carbon tax on On the cows. cows i think it was denmark yeah and so to me at this point this is just it's it's so clear that this is going to just for control because also none of these people ever want to admit the progress that we have made on the environmental front. So say they'll they'll shit on cars and say, well, our sure take a dump on the hood of a car. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, okay, go to certain just, areas in Toronto. Go yes. to certain areas in Toronto. You probably will actually yeah, yeah, see yeah. that. I just, I just, I just <laughs> but so where I'm going with the car thing is that. They'll attack cars, right? We've seen the liberals have proposed banning gas-powered cars by 2035. They'll sure, toss, they're po- they're they'll toss endless to amount policy. of billions yeah. of dollars into a dying EV market and such. 
But they'll never acknowledge the fact that before automobiles, cities were predominantly um, filled with horses and the amount of first piss and shit that horses let go, that was a serious problem in cities. And then also horse carcasses. Horses would die in the city and then their carcasses would just be left on the street to, to rot. Wild. And then two, you also factor in the amount of farmland that was necess- feeding them. Feeding them. Yeah. And so Thomas Sowell has, has, has broke this down in economic facts and fallacies, but he pointed out the fact that our actual emissions, like, from horses to cars are better. And even over the lifespan of us driving and using cars, they're gotten way better as well. You smell a muscle car a mile away. It's great. And so this is a very interesting kind of thing to ask leftists in general is like, at what cost are you willing to achieve your goals? Again, it's ideological. So to, to, to your point about implementation in the current system, it's not possible. Is that we actually need to backtrack on a lot of these taxes. I think in theory, it's a good idea. When I think about how it practically applies, there's zero chance that we can actually do it. When it comes to the liberals in general, climate change is, is their hill to die on. Yeah. But it's also the conduit with which they use to pass all their policy and to convince their masses and all their constituents that they're doing the right thing. They can't take their foot off the quote unquote gas on this. They can't. They've got no choice. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, if money's going into their hands, no. I don't think that that's a good system. In fact, I don't think anything in their hands is good. You and I have discussed that government efficiency and spending is probably 20%. So it doesn't matter how they're taking it from you. They're lighting it on fire and patting their own pockets. For me, that's a bit of a different conversation, but I do agree with you. Yes, like if it's going to go into the system that currently exists, no, just cut it completely. But do I think it could actually be better for the world at scale? Because of the, because of the nature of publicly traded companies with a fiduciary duty to increase your bottom line, that is your job. Hell or high water, that's what you need to do. It does create sort of this evil corporation thing over time. And that's why I think having some sort of check and balance in this sense isn't necessarily bad because then you could do something objective. And here's why. If, if there's a way to track all these things, right? I can say that company, you know, um, that company emitted X, number, X amount of carbon in, in this case. I don't think carbon is a big problem, but let's say that it is in this case. So that company emitted X amount of carbon. There's, a, there's an objective way to measure it. And then everybody's, kind of reports are what they are. But if you're doing something illegal, like dumping in the river, how many of those people do you think actually get caught? I actually think a fair bit. I don't think so at all. No, no, God, no. I, otherwise, they wouldn't do it. They bury it in the ground somewhere. How many people own a plot in the desert where they just bury their shit? Guaranteed. So you think about stuff like that. It's like they kind of get away with it anyway. So in theory, I like the idea in practicality with the current liberal government. I think it's very dangerous. And I think anything that kind of bolsters their climate change narrative to continue passing all this sort of draconian policy, that should stop. Well, this leads us into our second story, which is that net zero policies will have a trivial effect on temperature, but disastrous effects on people worldwide. Governments worldwide are pushing for net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 based on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes, or IPCC, assertion that CO2 is the main driver of climate change. However, career physicists specializing in radiation physics and experts in how CO2 affects heat flow in Earth's atmosphere challenge this view. They argue that CO2's ability to warm the planet rapidly decreases as its concentration rises, making it a weak greenhouse gas at current levels. The primary scientists behind the claims challenging mainstream climate views are Dr. Happer, who is a physicist from Princeton University, and Dr. Linzen, who is an atmospheric physicist from MIT. And actually, Linzen has helped with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But their research shows that the global effort to reach net zero by 2050 would result in only a trivial temperature reduction of 0.13 0.13 degrees Fahrenheit globally, despite massive economic costs. These physicists warn that eliminating fossil fuels as required by net zero policies would cause severe economic harm, including job losses and reduced access to affordable energy, particularly in developing countries. So, should Canada remove itself from the Paris Agreement and stop pursuing net zero policies? Uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, to our previous conversation, this has just become a liberal, um, the liberal hill to die on, right? Now, look, when you look, think about the Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees, there is currently and still no agreed way of actually measuring the temperature increase. 
That's insane. How can we have a 1.5 degree target? We have to stay below this. If we don't actually have a way of measuring it. How did they even let that happen? How did they go, ah, oh, just worry about that later? What are you talking about? These types of scare tactics have popped up every decade since the 1920s. Every single decade, there's been one to two reasons why they go climate, 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 we're all gonna die. Just, it's, 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 it's just kind of a broken record at this point, right? Um, and then when you look at some of the stats, so the global average surface temperature is increased by about 1.1 degrees since 1880, but the increase is not uniform across the globe and is influenced by natural variability. That's a NASA stat. Um, then you look at sea levels. Sea levels have been rising at a rate of about one inch per decade since 1900, with an acceleration to about 1.5 inches per decade since 1993. So when Al Gore comes out with an inconvenient truth and tells the world that we're all going to be under 20 feet of water, it's like, why are you such a fucking moron? And why do you get to stand on this soapbox and scream from moral high ground when you have no idea what you're talking about? I mean, these stats are pretty clear. When you actually look at the data, this is, this is mainly just scare tactics. Uh, I, I, I think we should drop out of it. I hope that we do, um, especially considering, like I said, we don't have a way of measuring the temperature and it varies widely across the earth. So when you think about that, it's kind of like one world government in a, in a sense. Well, we're going to tell you how to run the whole world. But how you run the world in Canada versus China versus South America, you, you, you can't possibly know how those economies and communities and cultures work. It's the same thing here. This is just, to me, it's just ridiculous. So one of the things that you were talking about with the not having an agreed upon way to measure the surface temperature is also when it comes to their projections, so they use models which are called the CMIPs. So th that's their model database that they use in order to project what the temperature rise will be over the next say century or two or whatever. Yeah. The more advanced those models become and the more data that they have, the greater variance between their answers they find. So as these models are becoming more complex, they're actually becoming less reliable. And so this is exactly what you're seeing where it's easy to say that you have one factor which is causing, say, global temperature rise, and that's ca carbon because we can see that there's been a correlation between the industrial age and the global surface temperature, and therefore we need to deal with this one factor. But as soon as you start implementing different factors into that, the, in, their entire idea just falls apart and we're, like their own, their own uh, models show this. And people will talk about it as if climate change doesn't just naturally happen all the time. And, you, you know, you look back. Back in the days when Greece was the main empire in that region, Egypt, and actually even Rome too, but Egypt was always one of the most prominent agricultural producers, and they supplied that whole region with wheat. And that's actually what left them open to being conquered so often by other, other empires, because they wanted their agricultural production. But now look at Egypt. Egypt has to rely on imports because their entire region has changed over the desert. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they can't grow anything there anymore. And there's all these different periods in history. And also, if any, I, I know that the most likely comeback to that would be, well, that's something that has happened over thousands of years. And actually, no, it's not. Their climate changed massively in a short amount of time. And actually, uh, Kunin, Steve, Dr. Steve Kunin, who's a physicist and also helped with the energy policies on Obama in Obama's administration. He's the one that wrote Unsettled. Yes. Uh, he, he pointed out this fact that uh, about what happened in Egypt. And so there's just so many things that fall apart in their narrative about this whole net zero thing. And again, going to like, what cost are you willing to, uh, um, what cost are you willing to have put on you in order to try, try to achieve your goals? You see them say things like, well, we need net zero. And Bjorn Lomberg has pointed out how it's going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% of the global GDP yeah. to achieve the net zero policies. But even in the worst case predictions of climate change, it will only hinder our economic growth by 4%. So like, this is, it's absolutely insane to to say we're going to incur a 10 to 15% economic cost to stop a 4% cost from happening. What? Yeah, like I said, the whole thing's just sort of a liberal talking point that's kind of run away. 
Um, like, you know, it, the reason I say that is because they've been using this scare tactic since since the 1920s, maybe longer, but definitely since the 1920s. That's that's something that's recorded in every decade since. But now it's got the most legs. So for me, I just go, oh, you guys did a good job of campaigning this time. Yeah. yeah good job with your propaganda. Because that's all this is, right? Like every time it was the end of the world. You know, if people were going to be scared, the 20 feet of water from the inconvenient truth should have been the that should have been it. Everyone should have been running for the hills, well, literal hills. And what's hilarious is uh, it was in the 1960s that the, the scientific consensus said we were heading towards an ice age and the entire world would become a yeah. Siberian climate. You're like, That's what, what I mean. It's, it's, so, so you look at this stuff and you just kind of go, oh, you guys are just utilizing social media and your propaganda tools better. Good for you. Congratulations. And you're using it to push through your policy. That's all it is. And OK, so think about these net zero policies. Here's here's the effect that they'll have to kind of put them into perspective for people. So. During the first year of COVID lockdowns, which were the most intense, there was a somewhere in the neighborhood of a four to six percent reduction in global emissions because obviously industry halted, transportation halted, all this kind of stuff, yeah. right? We would have needed to hit net zero, we would have needed a seven percent annual decrease in emissions from 2020 to 2030. So it's impossible. Year. So you would have needed to do COVID lockdown in 2020, and then another effect of COVID lockdowns, multiply that again for the next year, and then do that again for the next year, and again for the next year. What do you think life would look like in that world? Well, the other thing too, is you said four to 6%, and their target's seven, so we don't even know. Yeah. It's actually more intense than we've already had. There's no chance. There's just no chance anything like that can happen. See, that's the type of information, though, that when you hear it, you go, oh, how unrealistic is this nonsense? But it also, for me, the, the challenge I get too is, when you're putting a policy together that you know is a scare tactic, at least do the fucking math. Come on. Yeah. And one last thing before moving on here is somebody kind of gave us pushback. So first, they've, uh, they, they were claiming that we were saying that weather isn't changing and or the climate isn't changing. First, I've never said that. I think it is. I just don't buy into the idea that humans are the only cause for it. Are we making things worse? Probably, but not nearly enough to justify the current measures. Well, in, the climate's in always changing. Exactly. All so, the time. And that's always been our position. So You and I don't like never, climate change policy. Yeah. We don't think that it's necessary. And so, but then the way that they pointed this out to us was that uh, there was a hurricane that hit some area in Mexico, which has never been hit by a, a hurricane before. Again, you can go look at the IPCC's own reports, the AR5 report. They say that no observable trend in uh, extratropical cyclones, no observable trend in floods or droughts. So, Here's, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. And two, and this is another m big thing climate is defined as a 30 year window. So, when you're talking about the trends that happen in the climate, it's a multi decade thing. So you can't just take a single off event or even a year. You can't you can't compare this year to last year and then say this these are changes in the climate. It's no, it's like a 30 to 40 year window. Yeah. So the actual statistic from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the IPCC, there's been no significant increase in the frequency or intensity of hurricanes and tropical cyclones over the past century. In fact, the number of major hurricanes making landfall in the United States has decreased slightly since the 19th century. Hilarious. Same thing with forest fires, too, in our... Yeah, other than last year, which a, a, a majority of them were, were arson, whether intentional or not, we don't know. And also, we've, re we've reduced our parks budget, which should be removing dead wood, which we know contributes to, this, to the spread. So, bravo. But even though we had a bad forest fire year, the number of forest fires are still going down. So it's actually our management of forest fires is getting Rather worse the number of them, while yeah. the number of them is decreasing. Oh man, stats. <laughs> <laughs> so good. They just don't lie. They just, well, they just do. don't get the right they ones. <laughs> people, people use statistics to lie all the time. Actually, in the Soviet Union, they started implementing something called class statistics. So what they would give people and tourists, the statistics they would give to, say, visitors of the Soviet Union would be completely different. They would have been they would uh, label them. Uh, it was their like their goal is what they would give them of like production rates. They'd say, oh, yes, we 100 percent increase in production. Meanwhile, it's actually decreased by 30 percent. But they're just telling. Yeah. So what I mean is objective data. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not subjective. I'm going to use this the way I want and I'm going to kind of fudge things around. I mean, like actual like objective reality. Well, in 
a good like in this i i remember in one video that you did and on a Substack article I, I kind of pointed this out where it's like okay even the hard data let's say this year there's six record hot days and six record cold days and the following year there is three record hot days and one record cold day i could say despite the fact that those records are both decreasing, which is what is actually happening in this world, I could still write a headline based off of that data at record hot rates are happening at three times the rate as last year. Yeah. But it's overall, they're decreasing, but in it's just because the number of record cold days is decreasing at a faster rate. You can put in all of these headlines in place that are just right. completely the, the, manipulating the, the, the thing picture. is that's actually not showing people the data though that's just writing a headline right so that totally different but yeah, yeah. i agree i agree i mean it's we live in a world where everything seems to be manipulated to suit a particular narrative that's the way it goes and i think you and i do our best to avoid that and that's kind of the space that i'm coming from. yeah and i mean hey i i'm prone i'm prone to mistakes uh like i don't make them often but <laughs> <laughs> i'm just always quick to admit when i'm wrong so i'm good no i love that uh there's i think it was i think it was napoleon who said uh he goes never never be or sorry never be afraid to admit when you're wrong luckily i never have that issue though or something <laughs> of that sounds like my dad yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right dude cool <laughs> All right, moving on to our next story. We've got Canada is on track for record asylum claims this year. Here's why. The closure of Roxham Road in 2023 significantly reduced the number of asylum seekers crossing into Quebec from New York by land. However, this has not curbed the overall increase in asylum claims in Canada, which has seen a notable shift towards arrivals by air. Immigration experts attribute this rise to multiple factors, with a significant one being the increase in travel visa approvals. Once in Canada on a travel visa, many individuals choose to seek asylum, contributing to the growing numbers. Between January and June 2024, so a six-month period, Canada processed over 92,000 asylum claims, a substantial increase from approximately 57,000 in the same period the previous year. This surge has reversed the long-standing trend where land arrivals, especially, especially through unofficial crossings like Roxham Road, were more common than air arrivals. Ontario has now overtaken Quebec as the primary destination for asylum seekers, receiving around 48,000 claimants in the first half of 2024 compared to Quebec's 33,000. This shift has intensified discussions about the distribu distribution of asylum seekers across provinces and the allocation of federal support. So do you think Canadians are truly aware at how out of control our border and immigration system is? Not at all. I think it's a boiling frog situation. Take Ontario, for example. Just yesterday, I was doing some work on employment insurance numbers, so unemployment, basically. It's gone up over 10% and it's continuing to increase year over year. And we have 6.4% of the country unemployed right now. Again, and we have about 6.4% of the population that's currently unemployed. But what's interesting is Ontario has seen a 25% increase in people that are on unemployment, primarily between the ages of males between 25 and 50. Now, we're getting over 50% of the asylum claimants, but we're also getting about 42% of all immigrants coming to Canada. So this is... Like what, what these, these are the types of things you're going to start reading more and more of where you're going to see like, okay, more of us are unemployed. But like, remember back in the day, there was this big argument of immigrants coming in, taking our jobs and it was xenophobic to say those kinds of things and blah, blah. You don't hear that these days because everyone is too, too scared to say that type of stuff, but it's kind of what's happening. But at the same time, we're also not producing enough because our government's killed our economy. So we don't have any real strong economic levers to pull anymore to build business in this country and either we are looking for work because they'll bring in immigrants in the temporary foreign workers program and pay them less. And they basically have them, they have them by the balls if they're here on these permits or the people coming in are then going on some sort of employment insurance program. That's just Ontario. And that's just that one thing. It's also driving housing prices. It's also driving inflation. And all these things are going to come to a head. It's just that it's happening slowly, sort of one notch at a time. Like I said, employment's at 6.4% right now. What other things do you see in society that are sort of falling apart, but it's happening slowly so people aren't reacting? A lot of, a lot of things, pretty much every, 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 every aspect of, of Canada is getting worse right now. And it, it is crazy because people will look at it and go, well, you're just being negative. It's like, no, 
objectively measuring every there is not one area of Canada, whether it be healthcare, whether it be the level of immigration that we're achieving or any of these neighborhoods, they're not getting better, especially when it comes to the foreign worker program. It's only this is only going to get worse as well, because so it's not that they can pay them less for the foreign workers. It's that just like when you look at demand and supply, if the supply of workers in in, an employer is having a hard time filling a position because the supply of people applying for that job isn't there, then they face two options, either hire foreign to uh, expand their pool to choose from or offer more money for that position to try to attract more people, right? And so this that's how it's suppressing wages. It's not that they can actually pay less. It's that instead of having to say, offer more money and hopefully getting a uh, young Canadian or whatever to, to hop into that position, they now just hire foreign. Right, well, the supply's way up. And so you drive the price down, essentially. So something that should pay 25 can pay 17. Um, and like you sort of touched on there, healthcare is already overwhelmed getting worse. Crime, significantly worse, mm -hmm. all driven by these problems. But again, here's the issue you have. This has become partisan. This isn't about what's best for Canada or Canadians. You know, we're, and I believe we're already the most multicultural country in the world. It's not like I want to get rid of anybody. It's not xenophobic. There's no racism happening here. But we're not even taking care of the people that are here. You know what I mean? And it's because this is an, another liberal talking point. Open borders, bringing more people. I see people in my comments on our page. Like, oh, you guys don't get it. You need more people here for X, Y, and Z. It's like, the only thing you need more people here for is, like you said, to bolster their social programs. That's the only thing that makes sense. But that's become this, it's become like um, almost incendiary. So if you talk about it and you have any challenge for it whatsoever, then you're a right-wing fascist. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So, so, so the problem with this is when we just throw these terms at people, we don't even have a conversation about it. So we worry a little bit. You and I go, are things getting worse here? And are people noticing? Your, your, your question was, do they realize how to control it is? Well, well, no, you're not even allowed to talk about it. First of all, it's happening slowly, like the boiling frog. It's like, well, you can't say a thing or else you're ostracized, lose your job, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, this is, we, we have a, basically a recipe for disaster right now. And it's so crazy that if you just talk about this at all, like how we're doing, you get labeled far right, which we know is also synonymous with, yes, fascism. And so they'll hurl these labels at you, call you a call you a political extremist if you say anything questioning it, but then they can go to the extreme of their position and it's just celebrated. Nobody bats an eye at it. Like we just saw Toronto celebrated undocumented residence day with a Wild. radical panel discussion. Wild. So the discussion focused on how federal, provincial, and municipal governments could further support illegal immigrants, including calls for granting them permanent residency similar to policies in the EU and the US. So these people sit there and say, there, there's no such thing as an illegal. They support wide open border policies. If there is an illegal immigrant here, well, we should just make, deal with that scenario by making them a legitimate citizens so that they're not illegal anymore. And what's really interesting is Trudeau is actually starting to gaslight us. Just today, he announced that he is going to, or maybe it was yesterday, but he announced that he was going to limit the temporary foreign worker program in order to get it under control because he's admitting that it's been, it's gotten out of control. What's insane is the way that he claims he is going to deal with it, well, actually, he's not saying this in public, but if you go look at their recent amendments, the Liberal Party's recent amendments, this is coming from their own, their own government website, is that they're proposing expanding a new permanent class of economic workers and expanding it to tier four and five individuals, uh, which is like how they rank, essentially how good of an qualified, qualified uh, you're going to be, whether you've you know, got a doctorate, then you're probably like a tier one or whatever. Yeah. So they're, they're now expanding it permanent residency options for tier four and five people. Tier five experience is defined as no formal educational requirements and quote unquote, several weeks of on the job training. So if, if they've worked 
anywhere for a couple of weeks. They get to be and they've never they get PR. and they've never even gone to high school. They're now eligible for permanent residency yeah, in Canada. Yeah, this if, is a huge this, problem. If those amendments pass, the problem is right now it seems that the liberals and anybody supporting these policies just don't understand economics. Yeah, they don't understand how bad it's going to be for them. It's like they want to they want to let these people in because it's. I don't even know if they feel like they're on some moral high ground or they're just towing some political line. I'm not, I'm not really sure what it is. Or they're just not high achievers and just want everything to be free for them. They're socialists. I don't fucking know. But the thing is, you just have to understand such a small amount about the economy to understand how bad this is. And you know, it's interesting. I, I've talked about this before. You look at how America grew to be 350 million people. Now they're a little out of control with immigration because shit pants has got the border <laughs> open down there. I don't know what he's doing or why he's doing it. Sure, it's political, but anyway, maybe buying votes, whatever it is. Um, so, so they've been able to let 350 million people in. Thing is, if you want to go to the United States, there's a threshold to get in. You have to be tier one, two, or three. I don't even think threes really get in. Like, if you want to go down there, you have to have money or you have to be very qualified. You have to be a star at something. You have to be top 1%. I got a buddy that's just going down right now. He had to be the top 1% in his field, which he is. So he got granted. You know what I mean? You, you kind of look at their threshold. So you bring in high value people at whatever rate you want. But if that's your threshold, well, you can go to 350 million. You can have a functioning society. If you lower the threshold to non-existent, we have a population of 40 million. You could light this place on fire before it gets to 50. Bad policy. Immigration is not bad. Bad policy allowing these people to come in at this rate with no qualifications. Now that's bad. And objectively, like we said, economy, healthcare, crime, you name it, it's all a disaster. And this is the primary reason why. This podcast is brought to you by Higher Healths. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's made a real difference in my health journey, organ supplements. Recently, I was asked why I even take organ supplements. What benefits do they offer? How are they different from other vitamins? And how do I know they aren't just filler? So here are some of the benefits and why I get mine from Higher Healths. Organ supplements provide high levels of vitamin A, C, D, and E, as well as zinc and selenium, which are crucial for maintaining and boosting your immune system. With high levels of omega-3 fatty acids, choline, and antioxidants like CoQ10, organ supplements support memory, mental clarity, brain health, and heart health. Organ supplements also elevate your mood and energy levels, naturally balance your hormones, boost your metabolism, and support weight management. As for why I choose Higher Healths, their organ supplements are sourced from 100% grass-fed, grass-finished cattle raised by Canadian regenerative farmers. I also have a personal relationship with the founders, Nigel and Darren, who created this company to tackle their own health problems. So perhaps the better question is, why aren't you taking them yet? Improve your health with nature's multivitamin. Head over to higherhealths.ca and use promo code BLENDER, that's capital B-L-E-N-D-R, for a 10% discount on any bundle purchase. Higher Healths, connecting people to real food. Well, moving on to our next topic, we've got healthcare costs for typical Canadian family to reach almost $18,000 in 2024. According to a new study by the Fraser Institute, an average family of four in Canada will spend nearly $18,000 on healthcare services this year. The report, quote, the price of public health care insurance 2024, estimates that the cost of, for families will be $17,713 altogether. This figure reflects the indirect costs Canadians pay through various taxes, such as income, employment insurance, Canada pension plan, premiums, property taxes, and more, rather than direct payments for medical services. Nadim Asmail, the a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute, notes that understanding these costs is crucial for evaluating the public health care system's value and sustainability. The study reveals that healthcare expenses have increased significantly since 1997, rising faster than food costs, housing, and average incomes. So is Canada's healthcare system worth the cost? No, and it hasn't been for quite a while, right? Um, you know, the problem that we have here is, you know, the number of beds, the quality of care, um, primary care, all of those things have declined significantly since 2015, except our tax bill for healthcare has increased by about 30%. Um, I know they said 97, but I just did some stats based on Trudeau because he's my favorite. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. We've proven that the government can't manage this. They can't. And they just keep throwing more money at this broken system. And we also know that efficiency is about 20%. So when you take those things into consideration, you have to think about it like this. You had your chance. It didn't work. And it's only getting worse. So you, you have to let the private market in. So it's the same thing they're doing in the Netherlands, which has got the top tier healthcare. Now, there's a list put out uh, six months ago, and it was about primary care in 10 wealthy nations. Canada finished last. Dead last. I think that was like 81% of our people have primary care. The Netherlands was uh, the best. They were like 99%. So 
their system is a public-private split. And what they do is private can still work with, I think, anybody in the Netherlands. But what they do is their, their, their primary job is to manage overflow from the public market. So you kind of bolster the private market using them as an overflow and then still giving them an opportunity to make their money in the market for people that have more money or don't want to wait or whatever it is. So this system is proven to work in a place that is heavily taxed, right? So they at least had the wherewithal to go, this is not working. We're not doing the best job. This is the system we need to implement. So anytime you look at a system in a country that has sort of a similar approach and they, they sort of twist and turn their way to a much better solution, you need to be paying attention to those things. And the fact that we're not, it's just so much ego and nonsense and not wanting to admit fault or take any responsibility and put all that shit aside. I hope the next government comes in and goes, this is what we need to do and here's why. Um, because I think this is the only way we fix it. And with an aging population, we need a solution. Your mention about ego is spot on because I think the that's the biggest factor that is not allowing us to start repairing our healthcare system because people have had this very stupid idea that what makes Canada better than America is the fact that we have public health care. And therefore, because of this one thing, we're better than that country as a whole. There's a lot of like snoutiness that people look at in Canada towards America. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I don't think America's healthcare system is great. I think that there is a lot of issues with the fact that people will go in, prices aren't advertised. Uh, it, that's got to hospitals. Change. Trump's then, saying he's going to change it. We'll see, but that's got to change. It'll, it'll lower health costs by 50, 60% overnight. Yeah. So first of all, there you all of a sudden have more competition, but, but then also people can't just walk in, go, I need this. I've got this little thing bothering me and then walk out with $40,000 in costs or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, so there is like, I don't want the American healthcare system, but there's this, it's funny. Like we're told that there's, the you're non-binary when it comes to genders, there's thousands of genders you can choose from. But when it comes to healthcare systems, you you either have to be oppressively private, which the American system has become, or you have to be oppressively public, like which the Canadian system has become. And it's just like, are you guys not capable of any nuance here to understand that these systems can operate parallel to one another? Yeah, I mean, I think the chat, it's actually, in my opinion, harder to go from fully private to a public system. It, because the thing is the incentive, you lose the incentive. Doctors make way more money in the private market there. Um, and like they tried with Obamacare and all these other programs, it's been challenging. I do think they need to change the system, of course. But what I, why I'm saying this is I think we're actually in a better position. We're in a position of strength to make this change. It'll be better for the economy, it'll be better for the country. And it's a much easier transition because where there's money to be made, supply and demand, people are gonna be interested. But when you have to put, when you have to back into depending on a government system like they're doing in the States right now, that's much harder in my opinion. But yeah, I mean, you actually did the math on this, I think, well, one of us did. Um, and it was like significantly less money to cover the cost of healthcare in America and have good primary care. Like it was, it was like, I think it was like 50%. Once you, yeah, if, if, if somebody's got the, the average silver plan of health uh, insurance, then yeah, you could, cause it worked out to, at that time, the number that I was using, hey, if this number from the Fraser Institute is significantly higher than for sure, because um, the number that I was using was roughly $12,000. And with America, the average person paid, uh, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $6,000 yeah. annually for premium or for that silver insurance. And then they paid about another five to $6,000 in deductibles. I think the probably the one issue with that though, where... Americans might end up getting screwed harder than Canadians is if let's say they go in for emergency treatment or something. And then, and I don't know how common this is, but immediately after they receive that treatment, whether the insurance company goes, Oh, we don't cover that procedure. Or we don't cover that medication that you were given or whatever. Right. right. Well, I think, I think you need, you need I do know that like, yeah. one of the top leading reasons for bankruptcies in America is health healthcare costs. I thought you couldn't I thought you couldn't bankrupt healthcare costs anymore. Or is that just in America? Is that is that just education? Oh, that's that's education. That's just education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's just education. Yeah, you can you can uh you can still file for uh bankruptcy and clear it off. And I just want to I want to live in a system where 
I've at least got some sort of incentive to be healthier or the fact that I am healthy, that I should see some sort of reward from that. The fact that I'm paying into, like, again, I haven't used the healthcare system here in probably over five years now, six years, maybe since I've gone to a hospital or a doctor or anything of that nature. So it's like, why am I being taxed? for this. Like I'm not using this system because I am proactive. I try to take care of myself. So yeah, like, well, there's no incentive to get better either. I mean, it's, I, I think, I think it's pretty clear. Like the incentive structure for health is not strong. Um, the people that are in charge of our health departments are often in very yeah. poor, in very, very poor shape. You should not be telling anybody anything. I'm actually pretty confident the food pyramid caused the diabetes epidemic hundred mm-hmm. percent. So you look at that, you know, and it's, you, the incentive structure is bad. Then you throw big pharma into the mix and you kind of, that again, pushes the incentive structure down the wrong path because they want you sick. I'm not saying that doctors are bad. I think I've, I've had a lot of great doctors. I think they're good people. I don't think they think that way. Sometimes they can be maybe prescribing medication they shouldn't for payoffs in the United States and stuff like that for sure. But at scale, I think the doctors are good, um, good people anyway. I think big pharma though pushes it down the wrong path. And then they're also lobbying government. They're one of the biggest contributors on, to both sides of the aisle. So you kind of look at this kind of stuff and the, everybody's winning but the people, right? And the incentive structure is there for the government and big pharma, and even sometimes the doctors, but not 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 for society, unfortunately. So, I mean, I think in Canada, the best way to deal with this is to do a, pi- a private-public split. Um, people will bitch and moan and complain, but here's the thing. The more people that go private, the more available and open the public system is. So the wait times decrease, primary care when it can increase. So there's benefits if you can start pushing people off to other um, through through other avenues. Yeah. And hey, even if if somebody's got the money and says, I want to be able to choose my doctor, choose like where I can go spend this money, I'll pay a premium to get better service. Yeah. Why can't they have that? If, if well, they do still, anyway, if, they do anyway, they just leave. Or there, there, is, exactly. there, is a pre- there is a pretty big underground private market here. Yeah. yeah. There's but, a lot of ways to get around it. But so it is okay. Just allow that to be out in the open then. Because, yeah. because to your point about people going overseas. All right. Well, that's just economic prosperity leaving Canada. 100%. Totally agreed. Uh, All right, moving on to our next story. We've got RFK Jr. says he will continue campaigning actively for Trump as he vies for role as health secretary. So after Robert F. Kennedy Jr. ended his independent presidential campaign, he publicly supported Trump at a rally in Glendale, Arizona. He has also shown openness to a role in a potential Trump administration, though no specific position has been confirmed. Kennedy's campaign manager suggested he could be a strong candidate for Secretary of Health and Human Services, or the HHS. While Trump indicated he might offer Kennedy a role, Trump's vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance, clarified that there was no direct exchange of an endorsement for a cabinet position. Kennedy has proposed significant changes to public health agencies if appointed to HHS. He has criticized agencies like the FDA, NIH, and CDC, calling for their dismantling and restructuring to focus more on chronic diseases rather than infectious ones. Critics, including Dr. Paul Offit, argue that Kennedy's approach could weaken public trust in vaccines and undermine effective health policies. Despite these concerns, Kennedy has stated that he will actively campaign for Trump, believing that his support in key swing states will significantly impact the upcoming election. So would you like to see RFK Jr. as the head of health and human services? Yeah, I think, you know, we talked about the incentive structure. This changes it. This changes it. I mean, right now they've got a dude pretending to be a woman who's overweight and obviously mentally ill. That's the person running their health service department right now. That's mental. Um, Look, I think RFK made a good point. He said, "My, my purpose here is to try to make America a better place. And one of his primary targets has been healthcare for quite a long time. In fact, I think that's probably where he's most qualified. And I'm going to love people are going to be like, he says all these crazy things. They're probably not our audience, but a lot of times you see online, like, oh, he's spreading misinformation. He's not a scientist. He's not a doctor, blah, blah, blah. If those people just went and listened to him, even just watching the watching or listening to the Joe Rogan podcast, go reference the statistics in there. Just go reference them all. It's pretty alarming stuff. You know, people just, they just throw away because, because they've got the support of the 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 government and the media apparatus, they just throw terms at him and say he's this, he's that, he's all these other things. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Pretty well researched. The guy's done a lot of great work. He's got a really good education. Um, I found him to be quite credible. Now, you know, when it comes to his vaccine stuff, I think it's worth mentioning he's not anti-vaccine. He's pro-vaccine safety. 
All he wants is them to be held to the same standard as all these other medicines. They just need to go through safety testing. That's it. And now we've gotten to a point now, and we talked about this last time, where vaccines don't even go through the same, the same period with which they need to be, to be um, considered viable. Now the CDC just passes everything, or CDC, FDA rather. The FDA just passes everything through, like this is another COVID vaccine. Um, all these, the monkeypox, the flu, all these other things now. Well, now they just call them vaccines. They pass them right through and there has to be no safety testing. So for me, that's, that's, that's its own sort of sidebar. I have a bit of a qualm with that. I think there are some pretty alarming statistics that have come up over the last 30 years and increased vaccination looks like it's playing a pretty significant role. And I think that it deserves to be looked at. Um, and I think that there should be standard safety testing like there is for any other drug that hits the market. I think it's crazy that we're not. Anyway, um, sidebar done there. In general, if he heads these departments, I think he'll make a big difference for America. And I think he'll do a lot to actually change the incentive structure and move the needle the right way. You know, you look at places like China, you've seen these videos online, what their kids do when they're in kindergarten. They're all outside doing these massive exercises. Everything's in sync. It's amazing what these kids can do. All the way up to other, even if you, if you work for a business in these locations, you're on the rooftop doing gymnastics of some sort before you start your job. Sure, maybe you don't want to sweat in your suit. I don't care. Like you look at how these people, I think it might be Japan, but anyway, you, one, one of those countries, um, pardon my, my ignorance, but um, you, you look at what they're doing to keep their society healthy. Like how far would it go? Like what, what is it now? 77% of males that are age eligible to serve in the military in America can't because of physical and mental health issues. That country is a disaster. 50% of people are obese. 50% of adults in America are obese. 70% are overweight. They have a health crisis Actually, right Actually, with a World War III draft coming up, I know you're out of the age range. I'm not. Uh, I still maybe go. I should just get obese. <laughs> I'd still go. I'd still go. I'd still go. I'd be like, look, I, I know I, I can... Well, well, here's the thing. Fuck you. I'm shooting my knee. I'm not fighting for you. I, <laughs> no, don't, I don't believe in the I cause. Was actually, I was actually just going to say I don't actually believe in supporting this current government. Yeah. I don't. So as things stand, I wouldn't. But my, my natural inclination is to go fight. But anyway, um, you just kind of look at what's happening there. And everything's falling apart. And it's happening rapidly there. The number of people that have diabetes, all these other issues. And yeah, sure, that feeds the big pharma market. But at the end of the day, it's not good for America. And I think that if there's not too much bureaucracy, it'll be a good test. If there's not too much bureaucracy in the way. I think RFK could do a really great job um, at helping America in a very, very significant way. And one thing that I do like is if he does a great job there and stays in that department, and I know he's not traditionally a Republican, he's traditionally a Democrat, but he was chased out of the Democratic Party by the Democrats. If he sticks around for four years and does a fantastic job, Trump's going to be in his 80s. He's, he's already done his two terms. RFK might be a natural fit to run. And I, I think if he does a great job there, Get proof in the pudding, right? And I think, uh, you know, if I think about who I who I believe would do the best job for America today, of the three, he'd be my choice. Well, the you know, on the topic of Democrats being kicked out and finding their way into Trump's administration, just while we're sitting here, Trump has formally announced that Tulsi Gabbard will be joining his campaign to help fight against the Democrats. So Tulsi's the Tulsi's the truth. Tulsi should have been his VP. Yeah. So, you know, I think this is this this is good because, you know, you see RFK Jr., a healthy dude, can knock out a bunch of push ups at the age of what, 65, 70, 70. So he's oh right. Yeah. 70. Yeah. He's uh, still still hitting the gym, still got a six pack, still he works on jeans, which is super weird. But, I, <laughs> but hey, the results don't lie. <laughs> and then, yeah, you've got. Tulsi Gabbard now, who she she's a badass. She multiple uh, tours yeah, in the military. She's military. Great. Yeah, uh, she still can uh, get after it. And so you see people like this. I'm to your point about America being fifty percent obese. There's a lot of institutional problems with that. So, for instance, their food system, the amount of preservatives and industrial bullshit that they throw in there, seed oils, all this. Oh, crap. the food's so bad. It's so bad. But there's something to be said about. People, the people that are put in positions that the rest of the country will look up to, which naturally the greatest position for that is the head political administration. And so if you've got a guy in there or right now, I mean, it's not like Trump's a very big <laughs> health, health specimen either, but uh, on his own right, but you look at the current president and Biden, you're like, I don't look to him and go, oh, he's got no qualities that I would want to embody myself. Well, then you even look to the other departments, though, and you look at Rachel Levine being the head of yeah. the health department. I'm like, 
Don't touch my kids, you fucking freak show. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Sorry. And then so you see people like RFK, you go, okay, well, what would a president that even if like what kind of health differences would that make if there was a president even just talking about those things to the actual nation and also being an example of them that people would want to emulate and rather than what we've currently got, which is somebody that can hardly even stop themselves from shitting their pants. Exactly. <laughs> and then it's Captain shit pants. <laughs> so like at, at the very least that would obviously you would need policy to help deal with the, the health issues yes. down there. But I actually, I do like culture is so massive. And if the pinnacle of your culture is somebody that's in shape and talks about these values, it will fall down. And that was my point about the, 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 uh, either Japanese or Chinese culture. I think they probably do it in both places, I'm sure. But it's instilling that and doing it in schools and doing it in the workplace and pushing people to be healthy. Well, remember the video I showed you in South Korea of the thing that was in that national park where they had, yeah, the, where you would have yes, to go through. Let's go. So there was like this big archway with all these slots and poles running down it. And then it had a essentially a like sliding scale from fit to fat. Yep. And it was how how wide they were and you would try to fit through. And so there's just this like cultural awareness around it. And even if you look in certain of those Asian countries, it's not even just Japan. It is China, Japan, Korea, all of these areas. There is a large social stigma against being large. And so even Eastern Europeans, they're straight to the point. You yeah. Know, and then you see what, and then you see what we're doing here. Yeah. We're throwing them on the front of Sports Illustrated. And then we're saying you stuff. can't even act and everybody's healthy at every age. Look, objectively, you're not. Yeah. Do whatever you want to do. It's not my job to tell you that. But pretty much every disease is connected to being obese. Yeah. Pretty much every single one of them. It's all has to do with inflammation. You got no chance at that point. So don't tell me that everybody's healthy at every at every at every weight. Because it's incorrect. It's and, not true. And look, I think, uh, like, hey, if you want to go eat yourself into obesity, go right ahead. I don't Not care. my business. I don't care do about you what do. you do. But the, the difference is, is that just your right to do that does not also imply that I shouldn't have a judgment on it. So, like, look, you can have every right to go get obese. I also have every right to look at obese people and just go, nope. This idea that like freedom has to be synonymous with a lack of stigma. No, that's not true. No, we're on the same page. Yeah, it's, it's, I think ultimately, um, RFK would do good for the country if he was any, in any sort of position where he could actually move the needle. I don't think it would, mat would matter. I mean, you and I talked about him maybe heading the CIA or Trump Jr. did, and we were chatting about that. Um, that'd be really interesting. I think he'd do great work. You know, same with the health department. I actually think he'll do better in the health department, yeah. if I'm being honest. But the CIA was kind of a fun one because of what's happened to his family because of the CIA. Yeah. But but in either case, like you said, more good people in the White House, more good people as a part of the administration makes it all that more appealing and actually makes me believe that there is a way to fix things. That's how I actually feel with Pierre Pauliev too. Like, look, I don't think that anybody's going to, you know, no one's the silver bullet solution, but we live in a world where these things exist. So people are like, oh, all government's bad. Sh sure, sure. Great. Cool. Same, same page. But that's not the world we live in. So if I have to choose between two bad options, Pierre Polyev is a, is a much better choice than Trudeau and all of the policy that he wants to implement and the stuff he wants to repeal. That's the guy. That has to be. Same, same right now in the United States. Look, I'm not a fan. Personally, I'm not really a fan of how Trump carries himself. Um, but if I look at the machine and look at what's happening and look at, and look at the people that are following him and the impact he can make, that's the party. That is the party. So it just is what it is. Sure, you don't want any government there, but this is the best choice we have. And in, in, in saying that, what I'm getting to and over contextualizing is if these things can be repaired, these are the two parties in Canada and the United States that give us the best chance. As I'm sure you're all well aware, censorship is a massive issue. We've lost multiple social media pages and over 100,000 followers in the process, making this an uphill battle against government-sponsored narratives that are actively destroying our societies. If you're enjoying this podcast, we'd greatly appreciate your help by sharing this episode with friends or family who you think would enjoy it as well. Now, let's get back into things. All right, moving on to our last story for the day. We've got French authorities arrest Pavel Durov, the CEO of encrypted messenger Telegram. Pavel Durov, the founder and CEO of Telegram, an encrypted messaging service, was detained at an airport in Paris on Saturday evening after flying in from Azerbaijan. 
French authorities acting on an arrest warrant took Durov into custody due to allegations that his platform was used for money laundering, drug trafficking, and distributing illicit content, including material related to sexual exploitation of minors. The French National Anti-Fraud Office, linked to the Customs Department, led the investigation. Russian officials expressed outrage, accusing Western governments of hypocrisy. The Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson highlighted that Telegram was previously praised by Western NGOs like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch for resisting censorship in Russia, questioning whether these organizations would now defend Durov. Further developments in the case are awaited, as French prosecutors have declined to comment on the ongoing investigation. Durov's arrest has also sparked debates about the role of encrypted messaging services in facilitating crime versus protecting individual privacy. The implications of this case could have a broader impact on the use and regulation of encrypted communication platforms globally. Are these charges legitimate or just yet another attack on privacy and free speech? Um, I think this is a really big problem. These are these are definitely an attack on privacy and free speech. Um, by their logic, if 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 Telegram is responsible for crime and money laundering and extortion and all these child crimes, which which are horrific, well then so is every text message platform. Obviously, so is WhatsApp, which is also encrypted. Facebook and Instagram for sure. Now they've actually been found guilty of actually contributing to, um, I think, the distribution of child that kind of that material. Um, and in some other ways, but here's the thing: Zuck is not getting in any trouble because he he plays by their rules. He toes the line. And, you know, all you have to do is look at the Hunter Biden laptop story. He's like, "Well, I was told I had to do this, so I just kind of did it. I didn't really agree, but I went ahead with it." He plays by the rules. So they let him have his they let him have his business and make his money. And you know what's interesting is I believe it was about it was four months ago. So four months before um, this arrest, he did a show on Tucker Carlson, and when he was on the show, Durov explained that the FBI approached him to create a partnership with him, which he was obviously not interested. So um, instead they wanted his engineer. And what they did is they tried to recruit his engineer in secret behind his back to build a back door into Telegram so that the FBI could have access. And then Duroff was asked the question, you know, so, so America could have access? He goes, I don't know, it's a back door. Anybody could go in. So look, our free speech is completely under attack. And I know the argument is, well, bad things are happening to children. Yes, it's a very complex problem. And I, I hope that we can stop these things from happening and I hope we castrate and kill all those people. But is everybody's privacy and individual freedom the solution? Is giving these people more control the solution? Because so far it's never been the solution. It is not the way out of this mess. Um, so this is, this, is, this is actually a pretty big deal. Um, and I, I think it's gonna change how a lot of these encrypted messaging platforms sort of work and operate. And you know, what's interesting is the West was um, giving Russia trouble because Putin at one point wanted to I don't, I don't know exactly. I don't know if he wanted to hijack Telegram or get Durov in some sort of trouble or whatever it is. I don't exactly know. Um, but he was sort of, the West sort of lobbied for Durov and, and Telegram and Amnesty International I can did, break down and all why, those yeah. things did. Yeah, so, so anyway, he was able to get, out, get away from this problem. But now it's happening in the West. Now the West is doing the very thing that they told, that they told you Russia was going to do. And now it's funny, something just popped up that now uh, Putin and Russia are now lobbying to get his freedom from France saying, He's a Russian citizen and this, this is bananas, you shouldn't be doing this. But here's kind of the bigger problem. Here's, here's, here's the more macro, this is a bit of a micro. The macro is governments have had control over the world for hundreds of years. Empires, governments, whatever it is. Um, and I say this all the time, the number one weapon they have is the media apparatus, that's their tool. But when, there's, when there are programs like Telegram, like WhatsApp, like all these other things, even, even X, even Twitter, um, you can, you can poke a hole in all their stories. So now their, their, their megaphone or their media megaphone becomes much less effective because you and I can get the truth or you and I can get the truth out. They can't have this. So they are really beefing up censorship efforts and, and penalizing a lot of these corporations for not towing the line. Like in the European Union, if you, if you um, fail to comply with their rules, they'll charge, you, they'll charge you 6% of your global revenue which is billions and billions of dollars for these companies. It is wild. So it's so, it's, it's so punitive that you're either forced to lose your company or stand up for free speech, when most of these guys don't even care. That's why Elon Musk is so important at this point, and guys like Duroff as well. So um, the bigger problem you have here is free speech, individual freedom is completely under attack by all Western governments. 
and we need to do everything we can to fight it. So you brought up the child exploitation issue and how they use this as a justification in order to crack down until the, you know, this, it's the most powerful people in the world with behind the most powerful organizations. Like you put it, these, these bureaucracies and governments and these international organizations like the United Nations and such that are coming cracking down on these people until those people deal with the whole Jeffrey Epstein thing appropriately. You don't get to use child exploitation as your sword. As uh, like, that's this, a good is, point. this is what I'm going to use. Yeah, that's no, a good point. you've already done everything that you can in order to shut down investigations into what we know to be the biggest child predator in human history, possibly, and or at least in modern history, modern history, Western world. Yeah, and y- you've done absolutely nothing. You've You've actively tried to cover it up and not look into those things. So you don't get to use ch- that's a good children point. as your, no, as your I, excuse. I, I can appreciate that angle. I think that's, I think that that's a good talking point for people that may have these discussions out in public or with friends or family or whatever, because, you know, a lot of times you get backed into a corner and it's easy to say, well, the children, this, that, whatever. Oh, you're just not like some, I saw some I hardly ever see, I hardly ever see messages um, or comments or the hardly ever see comments, but I did see someone say, um, oh, you don't know the evil things this man has done. Champion free speech? Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? Just because these evil things are happening on his platform, it's like, give me a break. So I'm going to try to break down what's, go- what's going on here with this whole Telegram thing from a geopolitical perspective. And this is something that Mike Benz, who is my go-to source for everything global censorship-wise, he used to work for the United States uh, State Department. And so he is very familiar with the censorship. He calls it the censorship industrial complex. And so one thing that he pointed out was that, yes, like you see Russian officials expressing outrage about against how Western governments, including also NGOs, were praising Telegram for not caving to Russian pressure. Well, this is because the Department of Homeland Security, the DHS, and the State Department were using Telegram in order to undermine other countries so when they are doing clandestine operations to try to cause uprisings and color revolutions in other countries they're using things like telegram they in order to do it platform. and so uh in in mike benz has detailed this and shown you the like you can go find him the he does it, he there. does it Got way it. better than yeah. i do uh about how they definitely used the telegram in order to do their whole operations in belarus when they were and that's why that that's the instance that Russia was talking about there. Um, but what so what he's saying is that how they want, like you're talking about, the FBI wants a backdoor. They essentially want to be in there just like they already are with WhatsApp and all these other encrypted, quote unquote, encrypted messaging yeah. platforms. How they just want to be in charge of it. They want control of it and they're not trying to destroy it, but this gives them a leverage point on him now because you can just break his will with empty threats. He pro- prove, he proved that he was had a backbone and he's willing to stand up and say, no, this goes directly against everything I started this, this pro, uh, company for. So they're using this in the threat of jail time and prison time in order to try to get a leverage and say, okay, hey, give us give us the back door. All these charges will go away. It's insane. Yeah. It's just so wild where things are at. But yeah, so when you talk about like, you know, how significant a problem this is, when it comes to free speech, I think this is going to be a really interesting one um, because if they somehow pull out a victory here, I don't know what options we have anymore. Because like you said the other day, you know, we hypothesized about how it happened, but a guy got thrown in jail in the UK because of a because of a message between friends. And we don't know if a friend ratted him out, if it was some or 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 if they just have access to these things now. But either way, man, like we're back to carrier pigeon. It's wild. So just one thing here is that Hannah Ardent, who was one of the preeminent thinkers and kind of first actually to really break apart and and coin even the term totalitarianism uh, back in the 1940s and 50s was that the way she defined totalitarianism when kind of conceptualizing it was the 
breaking of the barrier between private and personal life. In a totalitarian system, privacy is non-existent. Right. If you live in a free society, you at least have some degree of privacy. Totalitarianism is when that wall gets wiped down. That's what we're seeing. They're trying to build, they're trying to tear down that wall. And anybody who dares put a brick on it is now getting threatened with jail time. Yeah. You know what's interesting too? Um, something to think about, and I know this is a little distant, but they want a back door, not for an acute problem. They want a back door for blanket access. The reason I know that is because of Pegasus 2. They just need your phone number. If they have your phone number, they can have complete access to your phones. They can have everything on it. So when you think about that, it's like, oh, if you have a real problem with it, with someone that you consider a high target, a high target adversary, um, you can already have access to everything they're saying and doing anyway. We already know these tools exist. So this is about scale. This is not about dealing with one or two people. This is a scale thing. They want more and more control. And like you said, we're inching closer and closer to totalitarianism. So I hope this guy gets away with it or gets it. I mean, how ridiculous would it be? If this guy goes back to Russia where he can be free. Yeah. What the fuck? Well, in John McAfee for as crazy as he can be, because I mean, he had some pretty crazy theories like that time travel already exists and that time travelers are here and stuff like this. So I whatever. like him. I think he's, I don't he's, even think he's dead. He's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, uh, he's definitely got a much larger tinfoil hat than I do. But one of the things that he was saying before, he was like, oh, and again, McA John McAfee is the guy that created the McAfee software services, which is like the original antivirus yeah, software, yeah. right? So one of the things that he pointed out before he died, or as if you <laughs> think he didn't die, but anyways, uh, one of the things- that, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, one of the things he said was, oh, you guys already think you, you're you fighting for privacy. You, privacy no longer exists. He was already saying that that wall has been smashed long ago. And to, to your point about programs like Pegasus, yeah, it seems like that's a thing. And, and even, you know, back to Edward Snowden uncovering what the NSA was doing, where they had access to every single American's email servers and such. Actually, one really interesting way that I think people should know that how how these global elites are getting around our own constitutions, whether it be the Canadian Constitution or American Constitution, any of these things, those governments aren't allowed to do certain things if it breaches that constitution. However, no government is held by some other government's constitution. So there's this thing called the Five Eyes which is a intelligence uh, treaty between Canada, America, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. And so what all of these countries do is they spy on each other's citizens and go do all of these illegal things that each government couldn't do and then share that information with each other. So it's like, oh, Jonathan, you're not allowed to spy on your kids and your family. That I, I never signed on for that rule. So I'll spy on them and then tell you what they're doing. There's no rules against that. And so this is how they how these these governments have gotten around this and created what we know today as the modern surveillance state. And it's kind of sad because if you look at it from a political party perspective, pretty clear what's going on here. It is. It's 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 weird, right? You know, I say, how do you make communism work? Well, the way you make it work is you Make sure enough of the guys that are close to you, guys and girls that are close to you, live well enough. Make sure those people have what they want and they will implement your, your, they will implement rule, whether it's the military, whether it's your cabinet, all these people, as long as they're all eating, basically it becomes an oligarchy. But as long as they're eating well, you can maintain sort of the status quo and communism in a sense, because that's really what it comes down to. Otherwise you can't implement it, right? Um, but it, it's becoming this sort of thing. And I, I probably sounds a little hyperbolic, but they are giving the liberals and the Democrats the opportunity to say and do what they want with no boundaries and no limits, but they are stopping Republicans and conservatives and most logical thinking people from fighting back and arguing against these things, whether it's climate change, um, gender ideology, LGBT stuff, all that, all that, all that kind of anything in that space. You just get ostracized and you get canceled. I mean, you can do these drag shows for kids, and if you show up to protest it, you go to jail. Like, what the fuck's going on there? So you just kind of look at that and you kind of go, you know, it's it's they've in a sense they've given power. To enough people to implement the rule, which is their constituents. That's kind of how I see a lot of this stuff. And it's, it is to this point, they're the ones that are sort of 
implementing and championing all this censorship. We need to control those people. They're saying crazy things. You know, it's, it's whether it's social media, you look at it in the States, everyone that was championing for the government to have more control over the social media companies, rather, all Democratic states and all the states that were saying, no, you guys are a public square. You can't limit any of this stuff, all Republican states. So it's, it's becoming this weird political battleground, which is really bad for society because that suggests that this will be an ongoing battle back and forth, right? Um, yeah, anyway, bit of a mess. One thing to say about your whole, how do you make communism work thing? Here's something I want, like a perspective that I think people should, are much better off taking when it comes to things like politics and realizing that when these regimes become extremely tyrannical, they can actually justify doing extremely heinous things in order to achieve their goals. So one thing is like, okay, how do we in the Soviet Union get rid of unemployment? Well, most people, their immediate thought in that scenario would, well, we need to create more economic opportunity in order to give more jobs to people that would like them. It's a pretty logical answer. But then you realize that the Soviet Union, how they dealt with unemployment was they would round up unemployed or homeless people in trucks and then take them into the countryside in the middle of winter and drop them off miles upon miles upon miles away from city centers and just let them die. That is dealing with the unemployment scenario. That is getting rid of unemployment because you're just killing the unemployed people. It is a solution. And so <laughs> it's not a good one. And exactly. So, the, and that's, that's my point is that it is, if you identify that as a problem and you, in to my earlier point about at what cost are you willing to achieve this goal? Right. Well, if, well, this is a problem and we need to solve it at all costs. Well, then you can end up in very dark thought patterns in, especially when you get into these regimes that are completely taken away from like, Mao, for instance, while millions of people were dying in, in famine, he hardly had any idea because nobody was telling him because he would lash out and fire or kill anybody that told him the things he was doing weren't working. And he was up in his ivory tower. So he just, he just literally didn't see it. Millions of people in famine. Uh, so, <laughs> and so, but, but that's my point is that, yeah, even if let, let's say it's okay, well, We've got misinformation, a misinformation issue, and people are trying to, and foreign hostile governments are trying to undermine our governments and our authority and our, our democracy. Yeah. Well, how do we solve this issue? Nobody's allowed opinions anymore. Yes, we just need to, we need to stifle free speech. We need to stifle privacy. Everything in the open. Next thing's the thought police. Good luck, everybody. Wild. Yeah. Anything else you want to add today? That is everything. All right. Before we get out of here, don't forget to head over to our Substack where you can find original articles, a newsletter which goes out for five days a week, exclusive podcast episodes, and direct access to us as well. So thank you for everybody listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody.